All right, so this week's lecture is about back of the envelope calculations, which napkins too. Um, they're also called Fermi problems, named after the famous physicist Enrico Fermi, who loved these types of problems and made them popular. So what are back of the envelope calculations? They're basically calculations where you're estimating the order of magnitude of a value. Now, why would you be interested in that? Let's say that you need to buy a piece of equipment um, and you're thinking about doing an experiment that you need this equipment for and you need to know how precise or what range you're going to be working in so that you can buy the proper attachments to the equipment or the software or whatever. So then this is the kind of thing in an experiment where you would really need to be able to make an estimate as to the order of magnitude to an unknown quantity. It's not as simple as um, some of the problems I'm going to do today where you could easily look the answer up on your phone, okay? Um, if you're doing scientific research, nobody knows the answer. And so you're going to have to be able to make logical, thought, thoughtful steps about what the orders of magnitude are so that you can properly predict and anticipate problems in your experimental design. It also, if you have the capability to do these kinds of calculations in your head and quickly on the back of a, a napkin, it allows you a sanity check in complex calculations and also in experiments within the lab. It helps you check and make sure that the answers that you're getting from the equipment make sense. So as I said, um, Enrico Fermi is the physicist who made these kinds of calculations popular. Um, he worked on a lot of um, projects, important projects, regarding the Manhattan Project and the building of the atomic bomb. Um, he, one of the most famous back of the envelope calculations that he did was to estimate the strength of the atomic bomb that was detonated at the Trinity test. And the way that he estimated this was he dropped some pieces of paper and let them fall while the explosion was going on and then measured how much they deflected from the path, the straight line path. Um, so he basically estimated the blowback. He knew his distance from the explosion. He was able to estimate the strength of the explosion from just those simple things. Um, he estimated it is 10 kilotons of TNT, and it turned out that the true answer was accepted to be 20 kilotons, you know, years later. And so you can see that he was pretty good at these sorts of calculations. So the basic thing is for all the calculations that I'm going to give you on the worksheet and things that you're going to have to do in class, um, looking things up, using your phone, using the internet in any way to just obtain a number is cheating. Okay, you're going to have to get the right, right order of magnitude just by making uh, educated guesses as to what things are. Okay, so you're training your brain. So turn off your phones, all right, and treat it like a game. You shouldn't need a calculator, okay? You uh, should be able to do these simple multiplication division problems in your head. I'm not asking you to do anything more complex than multiply a couple of one-digit numbers together or and multiply powers of 10, divide by powers of 10, things like that, all right? Um, and in fact, this is good training because there's the saying, guy go, garbage in, garbage out. Um, I know a lot of physics students and students in the sciences They'll put numbers into the calculator and the calculator will spit out a number and they'll take that number as something sacred and the reality is that their finger slipped or they didn't do the order of operations right and that number is total trash and they just calculated a speed that was larger than the speed of light and they wrote that down for an answer on a test thinking that it made sense. Okay, So you have to train your brain to know when something's logical and when something's not logical. Okay, um, and you have to train your brain to realize that if you put in, you know, a thousand divided by ten and got a million, that that's dumb. Okay, and it, that takes practice. So, uh, no calculators are going to be allowed, and no phones and no internet um, for the worksheets. And I'm not kidding. No calculator. Okay, so. When you're making these estimates, you're going to pick whole numbers that are easy to multiply, and you're just worried about the order of magnitude. So, for example, if you're trying to calculate the area of a circle and you needed to do pi r squared, then pi, 3.1415927, blah, 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 it's really 3. Okay, that's, that's where we're going with these order of magnitude calculations. And by the way, so is E, the power E, 2.781828. It's three, okay? So that's the kind of calculations we're looking at. Um, square root of five, you're going to whip out your calculator and put in square root of five? No, you're going to say it's two, okay? That's what we're talking about. 
um, you're only estimating. It's the order of magnitude that's important, and so this is what we're getting at. So to remind you of some simple mathematical operations, um, when you're multiplying powers of 10, you just add the powers. So 10 to the 5th times 10 to the 4th, that's 10 to the 9th. 10 to the 5th divided by 10 to the 4th, if you're dividing powers of 10, you subtract the powers, so that would be 10. If you're raising a power to a power, 10 to the 5th to the 5th power, that's multiplying the exponent, so it's 5 times 5, which is 10 to the 25. If you're taking a square root, remember that square root is the same as raising it to the power of 1 half, okay? So the square root of 10 to the 6th would be 10 to the 6th to the 1 half power. 6 times a half is 3, so it's 10 to the 3. So this is the kind of math that you have to do. You should not need a calculator to do this math. So let's go over probably one of the most famous um, back of the envelope calculations uh, for Fermi. Uh, how many piano tuners are there in Chicago? All right. So when you're doing this kind of thing, it seems sort of impossible. You might want to just whip out your phone and say, I don't know, I can Google that though and figure out how many piano tuners there are. But you can estimate it. So you just need to make a list of uh, values that you might need to complete this calculation and then estimate those values and I'm going to take you through how to do that. Okay, so what do you need to know in order to answer this seemingly impossible question? So there's a few things that are probably a little bit more important than others. The first one is, well, how many pianos are there, right? And then how many people does it take to tune those pianos, okay? Um, and then the rest is just details. So how many people are there in Chicago? You might not know. I mean, yet again, this is something you could easily look up on your phone, but I want you to estimate it. Um, it's a big city, so what, what do you think? Well, it can't be more than 350 million or so, because that's about how many people there are in the United States, all right? And if you think about how many people are in big cities, um, if you personally know that like in the DC area, there's about 7 million people, New York City, 13 to 15 million, depending on things. A lot of big people have been moving out of the upper Midwest recently. So I'm gonna guess Chicago is about 5 million people. Who knows, okay, but 5 million. Let's say I'm wrong, let's say it's 7 million, let's say it's 8 million, who cares? 5 million, order of magnitude, I'm not even off by a factor of two if it's seven or eight million in Chicago. And if I am off by a factor of two, who cares? I'm just trying to get the power. All right, so, so this is supposed to be a five, sorry, typo. So then how many pianos do five million people own? Okay, so that's kind of tough, but you have to be able to make an estimate and then explain your reasoning as you go along. So I'm gonna guess that probably about 1% of the population actually owns a piano, about one out of a hundred, okay? It's it's definitely not one out of two. I mean, half the people I own, know do not own a piano. And I'm gonna say it's probably not even 20% or even 10%, okay? So that means that one out of a hundred is a pretty decent estimate of the percentage of the population that, that does it. Okay, now, let's come at this from another way. One way sanity check to check your logic on an estimate might be, how many people even play an instrument? right? Let's say 10%. 10% of people play an instrument and um, enjoy practicing that instrument, so they would own an instrument. So then maybe if you think maybe one-third to one-fifth of those people might be piano players, then you're again looking at just a few percent of the population that might own a piano, okay? So one percent, one times ten to the minus two pianos per person, okay? That's, that's the way this kind of calculation goes. Okay, so if you have 5 million people, that's 5 times 10 to the 6 people, and 1 times 10 to the minus 2 pianos per person, then you have, um, that's supposed to be a 5 times 10 to the 4th pianos, or 50,000, which is a decent estimate, a good number, okay? Now, how many piano tuners does that take, and how often do pianos need to be tuned? So, more than once a decade, I would say, probably, um, if you're a good piano owner, you probably want to have it tuned semi-regularly, but definitely less than once a month. So let's just say once every year, once every couple of years, okay, that you might have your piano tuned. And then how long does it take to tune one? Well, not 30 minutes. It's not a super fast process, but it probably doesn't take all day either. So let's say a couple hours, okay? And then you could also come at it another way and remember that there's 88 keys, that means 88 strings, one to two minutes a pop for tuning, 
two to three hours, okay? So that's our estimate. So let's say that one piano tuner works 40 hours a week for 50 weeks a year. That's 2,000 hours a week. And that would mean that they tune about 1,000 pianos a year, all right? So if there's 50,000 pianos and 1,000 pianos a year, then we need 50 in Chicago, 50 piano tuners in order to be at a steady state, all right? So that's our estimate. That's what we're going to guess, 50 piano tuners in a city like Chicago. Okay, now the exact number I came up with, totally not important, okay? The order of magnitude, the, the order of magnitude, the quantity, that's what's important. Um, that would be what would be important for buying instrumentation or for an experiment. The better you do it, your estimates and assumptions, the more powerful it is. Factors of two, maybe you want to think about, but a 10% difference, totally not so important, right? Who cares if I said 50 piano tuners and it's actually 55 or 45, right? Or even 40, right? What difference does that make? You know, 50 is a pretty good guess. So if you think about the result, then I'm saying that if I say 50, then what I mean is that there's probably between 25 and 100, which is pretty reasonable, right, for a city like Chicago. And then I'm super sure that there's between 5 and 500, okay? So I'm super sure that I've got it within two orders of magnitude, right? And then I'm super, super sure that I've got it within three orders of magnitude. So there's definitely going to be between 0.5 and 5,000 piano tuners in the city of Chicago, okay? So you're kind of placing a confidence interval on it, if you will. All right, so that's um, what I have to say about order of magnitude calculations. The best way to learn how to do order of, uh, order of magnitude calculations, back the envelope calculations, is to do them. And to that end, I'll see you in class.